Okay. <clears throat> well, I hope you enjoyed your seventh inning stretch. Let's see whether I can't put you back to sleep. <laughs> okay, so my, my agenda for this afternoon is I'm going to tell you some bits about um, MXF and the in internals of it. We'll do a little bit of viewing and inspecting of what you find inside MXF files. Um, I'm going to talk about profiling. In other words, how you specialize MXF to your own needs. And uh, of course, going through the route of the Air Ready Master or the Library Master is one step along the way. You've got to do a bit more for yourselves, too. Um, so we'll talk a bit about best practices and um, the way in which to make use of the available specifications. And Q&A, lots of Q&A, I hope. And um, I'm probably not very good at looking up and looking around, but if you have a question, please uh, leap to your feet or something so that, so that you can ask a question right in the flow of things. Okay. Um, so let's start off with some technical deep dive, maybe, into MXF technical stuff and some deployment experiences of it. And I'll tell you a bit <coughs> about how the last decades have gone. So. Uh, MXF files also have these things called packages in them. Don't confuse these with IMPs, uh, IMF packages. In the MXF space, and a package is a very well-defined piece of structure of metadata that's there to actually contain the content inside the file. And um, uh, we created an MXF package to be a very rigorously defined syntax, but also very flexible to allow you to put identifiers into your file, to put all kinds of tracks, be they picture, sound, smell o vision um, uh, captions. Um, my new favorite um, form of essence, actually, is um, hand signals for the drunken incapable. Um, and we'll, we'll see that uh, turning up as a, a well-known track type. Um, place to put many kinds of time codes. Um, you could indeed have 50, 50 ways to stripe your media or Perhaps it's uh, 50 shades of drop frame inside your MXF file. Um, places to put descriptive metadata, um, which I love, descriptive metadata. Actually, I'm a bit of a metadata addict. Um, and um, this syntax is used to create um, really quite complicated structures to enable you to express in the technical space the kind of information that Clyde has been ex explaining to you that you need to have in terms of compositions and profiles and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> MXF started from the realization that we needed to migrate away from videotape. So here is my favorite videotape recorder uh, with my favorite videotape on it. And the first thing that I'm doing at the stage of ingest is I begin to make some idea of what, a, what is it that I'm taking out or taking off this tape in order to put it into my digital media system. So actually, in the course of doing that, effectively, you're creating my first package. And this is saying I've got one picture, I've got, um, um, in this case, four audios, I've probably got um, a Vitsy track that I've got to pull out of that. I may actually want to be pulling out line 21 at that point in time and, and converting it, so on, so on. Also, uh, beginning at this point, this early stage, to work out what, what are the channels, what are the audio tracks that are on here? Um, have I got stereo? Have I got a 5.1? What have I got? I mean, obviously, you won't get a 5.1 on a, <laughs> on a one inch, but, <laughs> but you get the idea. So the next stage is that you go through the digitization of your content. And the picture across the bottom here is kind of like an anatomically correct picture of the kind of things you'll find in an MXF file. So if you look here, we've got um, a bunch of time codes, frame by frame time codes. Um, we've got the individual pictures. We've got the audio tracks. In, in fact, this picture was, was uh, drawn for um, uh, um, library and preservation um, use by the Library of Congress, and they really, really want in that space even to keep a digitized version of the longitudinal time code. Okay, I don't think you probably want that anymore, but they certainly wanted to retain this for forensic use um, and uh, for historical uh, accuracy. So at the same time as you're creating, you're actually ingesting this, you're beginning to create 
my second package, in, in MXF terms, this is called the file package. And here we're representing, again, the extent of the, of the media that we've created. We're actually putting these very specific now labels for the tracks involved. So I'm definitely bringing in my left, right, and my, um, oh, well, I've got a silent track, or uh, I've got an LTC track in this case. Um, also, labeling the time codes so that you may have original production time code, you may have the um, intended distribution time code within your house standard. You also create a kind of third level of package. We call this the material package or the master package. This is actually saying, now I've got this content, how am I going to put it out into the world? How am I going to what timing and how am I going to relate the individual pieces of the digital essence to the actual playback. Um, having done all that, of course, you can say goodbye videotape because now you've got a reusable digital media asset. Okay. Um, go one stage a little bit deeper into this because another area of metadata, and this is something that has been created as the uh, MXF format has developed over the years, is a segmentation metadata track. This is the place where you're going to have the ability to put your SOM, EOM, or you're going to be able to put your break structure and represent that in a metadata construct um, within the MXF file. Um, the other thing I want to say at this point in time is that um, Clyde has explained to you the Air Ready Master and the library master and how the two things coexist. And uh, what we have seen in the neighbor effort is that some people um, are mostly interested in putting in place a common file for <coughs> their existing workflows where they are very used to air ready masters or single um, interleaved and pre-formatted pieces of content. Other people are much more interested in the idea of a library master where you've got individual components of the content which you then have CPLs and um, OPLs to rearrange in order to package for particular uh, deliverables. So one thing I wanted um, you to do was to, to understand that um, perhaps the most um, important part of the IMF MXF duality is that if you created that all that useful metadata and you've done it in the form of the Air Ready Master and then at a later date you're going to migrate your system and maybe on a later technology refresh cycle you'll move from your um, single Air Ready uh, environment into one where you're uh, putting in place a library of reconfigurable content. It's kind of safe to do that in a two-stage process because the rigorous syntax and the rigorous data um, uh, specifications that are within the entire MXF um, standards is such that you're not going to lose any metadata when you take a uh, interleaved master and you explode it into a library master or vice versa. The data remains the same in every instance of the file. So this slide, this is just um, effectively showing you how that previous picture that I gave you, which was the very well interleaved media, is now exploded into a whole bunch of individual components, has a CPL and um, a packing list associated with it, created from the metadata, and so you can end up with a group of files that is the IMF or library master format representation of the same content as you were previously using in the um, Air Ready master format. Put simply, some people like to have the, the simplicity and reliability of a single asset. Other people want to have the flexibility and rearrangeability of a group of files. And MXF, as the underlying technology, allows you to do either. Okay. Um, let me stop at that point in time and ask how I'm doing. Have any questions come up already? No one going to ask me a question now? All right, let's keep going. Um, it all started about 20 years ago. Um, this was, in fact, one of the very first pictures that was drawn of an MXF file. 
Um, it uh, has become somewhat more complicated since then. Um, I just want to show you one other little picture, which is, um, uh, and again, a very early picture of what was created when we were trying to distill down to the very most basics. What is the way in which you format digital media into individual reusable components? And, um, <clears throat> and I think we did succeed in doing that. Um, but I guess what happened was that we realized that we'd, we'd um, um, bitten off a much bigger bite than we thought we were going to. I, I was very embarrassed in about um, 2000 and whatever because I was giving conference papers saying, oh, I predict this is going to come to market like, ooh, next NAB. <laughs> um, I have over the last uh, decade or so seen how the, um, pen the market penetration and the use, uh, use of MXF has really grown to the point where now um, it's essentially has, has become the dominant high quality uh, professional digital media format. Um, but there's been an awful lot of work involved in it. Um, uh, let me see, what was, did I get my slides wrong? No, I didn't get my slides wrong. Um, so those, those two pictures that I gave you of the propeller head parts of the, of the development of MXF is one of the enablers of this idea of the cookbook version of MXF, which is the, what uh, Clyde has referred to as saying, here is a way to make reusable blocks and to take those to arrange them in the way that individual businesses want to use. So um, just a, a kind of brief review of history. Um, this, uh, well, as I was putting this um, list of dates together, this came in kind of three-year cycles is uh, how it came for me. So we, we first started this in 1998. Um, first products, and the, actually this was the first, um, be, um, they weren't yet called XDCAM, that was D10, right? Back then they, they came to market in 2001. SEMTI did its first standard cycle publication in 2004. Um, at that point in time, it was already understood that um, individual business users would have their own individual profiles um, and um, uh, thanks to Turner and PBS and um, some other US government areas, also thanks to the digital cinema <coughs> packaging um, format, we, uh, at that early stage we're producing application specifications. Um, um, Three years later, we went through the cycle of, this is like the first step towards IMF with groups of files. And um, Clyde, actually, 10 years ago now, as um, the, within Turner was the person who put together the ASO2 specification. Um, MXF, um, I have often been chastised for it being 700 pages. <laughs> In fact, let me just chastise myself some more. <laughs> um, there was a reason that we had to do it this way. We needed to get people on board. And because we needed to get people on board, the, um, there were all these pre-existing conditions. There were all the pre-existing implementations. What we wanted to do was to produce a specification that was so big that it had something for everybody and that was so compelling that you had to get on board. So actually one of the very earliest stages was to say, what can we do to make sure that Sony can't say no and Avid can't say no? <laughs> Okay, and that led to nine different profiles. It led to half the 300 pages or 700 pages and whatever. So we created this monster, and we've spent 20 years reducing the monster down and rendering it down to a point where we can have universal applications. <coughs> and um, I do think we've made a lot of progress towards that. Um, um, so in 2010, cycle, there were many, many per, per user application specifications. ASO3 was a, uh, a, a standardized version for PBS member stations. Uh, so, so that station group, if you like to call it, that is 170 to 180 um, um, destinations for the content out of Virginia. AS10 um, was a way of um, adding necessary kind of uh, public information on top of the Sony RDD9 XDCAM specification, and that was driven and, um, by CNN again at that point in time. AS11, as has been explained to you, 
um, were, came out of the need for the UK DPP single um, uh, distribution format. There are other ones. AS12 is a specification for advertising metadata. Um, I'm also particularly um, uh, familiar with AS07, which is something that I've been doing with the Library of Congress for a while. Um, their need is to make a long-term preservation format. In fact, they call it ASAP. Which is, it's actually not ASAP, it's Archive and Preservation. Um, but uh, we've put a lot of work in that, into making sure that we had a, a place to enshrine some of history into the MXF format for long-term library availability in digital media formats. Um, next cycle, IMF. Um, work driven by the studios, the six, seven studios, um, came to the fore in the 2013 time frame. We're now going through this cycle of rationalization. Um, my hope is that the Air Ready Master and the Library Master, riding on top of the SEMTI standards that um, they, 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 they do rely upon, that that will actually show us rationalization to the point where we have reduced the uh, reduce the, the need for you all to understand 700 pages. We reduce it down to the point for you to be able to relate to about five or six pages. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm hoping to get to. Okay, um, again, questions? We're doing okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to um, just change direction for just a minute. Uh, excuse me. Um, so Metaglue Corporation was my company. We started in 2002, and we started because we knew a bit about MXF and metadata, and what we realized that we needed was that we really needed to help the end user. And that's what we've been doing ever since, is to try and help the end user. As part of that, we knew that we needed to create a tool, and so we created a inspector so that you could look deep into the depths of, of MXF files. And um, this slide that's on the screen here, I know it's a terrible eye chart, but um, um, I'll tell you now why I'm doing it, because as you browse through the content, you get down to, God, where I put it? It's off the screen. That's why. Let me just scroll down a bit. Deep down in the guts of the file is a crucial piece of metadata, which has never actually been standardized in a media file format, standard media file format up until now. And this is the uh, spoken language specification. It says that this track within this audio, within this program, this is actually Spanish Mexican. So, and I, I, I excuse myself because I'm here in Canada, it probably ought to be um, um, FR-CA <laughs> as the, the language spec. But this now provides a standardized place to mark within MXF files um, some of the information that you need for doing international distribution and to automate the international um, uh, reformatting, repackaging. So there's a number of other views um, of MXF files that we could go through here. Um, at uh, one level, we actually tried to keep things down, simplified even down to that package map level. Um, we also uh, went deep into the metadata, show you that, and go even deeper. So if you're a engineer and you need to get like right down into the depth, we can even take you down into the hex level. Having shown you that, the idea of the common specification is that this kind of stuff is the kind of stuff that you put in the back room and you only use it when you have the one out of 100,000 problems um, um, that uh, um, we confidently predict is all that you will experience. <laughs> um, um, I also saw a flying pig. <laughs> okay, um, back to me slides. So uh, one of the things that you will need to do is you will need to, uh, if you look at a common specification such as AS11X, you'll see that um, um, it has a lot of, um, excuse me, I pressed the wrong button already. Um, I'm not good at this. 
Where's the mouse? Okay, so MX Surface is this big toolbox with much flagellation going on. There's other big toolboxes that come in here, the MPEG, or AVC toolbox, XML itself is a big toolbox. There's the captions and time code standards where we've got 30 or 50 years of development, 40 years of development of captions, 53 years, I think it is right now, of development of um, 70 time code. Um, you've got to be able to choose the right tools for the job. And the common specifications that um, we have created, the neighbor specification, aims to enshrine a consensus. Because once you have a consensus and people start doing things the, right, the same way, you get business reliability, you get efficiency. You know, it would be a terrible, terrible thing if um, all the wheelbases and all the cars in the world, or all the wheelbases and all the trains in the world, were all different for the different tracks. It's kind of nice that we've standardized on four foot eight and a quarter, I think is what it is, apart from the French, they've got eight feet. <laughs> um, so AS 11. X documents the level of consensus. Even so, we had to have nine versions, AS11, X1 through X9, and we expect that there will be more in the future. Um, what we did is, in, when writing the specifications, we made the common technical specifications just in a kind of cut and paste way so that you can just say, I'm using the common specifications, but individual businesses have unique requirements. Um, you may have, for example, your unique brake structure, or you may have your unique, your unique cultural requirements. You may have a different set of six words that you can't say on air in your region. Okay. Um, the goal is to make it so that you can document your specific requirements in the annexes of the specification. Um, we're also trying to produce a profile document or a spec document that's going to be read by a number of different communities. So system architects are definitely going to be probably the people who put these together and write them. Vendors, you really want to read these specifications because actually for the first time you're telling them, dear Mr. Vendor, just send this to me. Don't send me your secret sauce. <laughs> um, QC teams and to read these. And that QC team includes um, the QC automation. As you want to have a standardized format with standardized set of options so that they can pull that out and give you a uh, efficient um, development of a QC profile for that particular content chain. Your business partners, you will be wanting to trade these specifications between business partners. I imagine a kind of a darkened room where you each put your own spec on the table and then you bid as to who's, which, which, which one wins the game. Um, the closer it all comes to, together, the, the, the more likely it is that you will find, just as Clyde found with his QC discussions, that actually um, consensus is easy once you have a groundswell of commonality. Um, okay, uh, last category of people who've got to read your specifications is developers. Um, I have learned over my career that the one group of people who I think um, probably even forgotten how to read is software developers. They, they know how to write. They can write code, but um, they're not so good at reading it. I, I think that um, there's a number of things that you've got to do to get a software developer to actually get the benefits of the English language. Um, um, since you can't get them to read it, you need to have something that you can beat them over the head with and say, this is what I asked for, why haven't you done it? You also need to have uh, something which is uh, along the lines of saying, this is the sample material specification that we're going to exchange and whatever. This is what your own software QA, engineering QA department is going to use to judge you um, on the quality of the software that you develop. Um, so. One of the experiences that I've tried to put into this is the experience of how to work with the software development team and how to make things in words of one syllable or fewer um, and, and um, um, you know, subtitles for the, um, for the for sub, sub, subtitles for the hard of reading. Um, okay. Uh, what I found is that these profiles and the, the kind of qualities that we want in them, we want them to be actionable. 
We want them to be concise. We also want them to be future-proof, and that future-proofness is something that you've actually got to pay attention to. One reason you've got to pay attention to it is that nothing is stable forever, and you will have new businesses, and you will have something different that you want to do next year. And yes, a vendor will introduce a new compression scheme, and somehow we as a user community have got to have a way to take that on board and to make it so that the new developments in the industry don't basically cut us out at the knee. <laughs> okay. The thing that we want to do is we want to have a framework that says that we, the users, want to pull this information, and we all together want to pull this specification so that we can have a uh, well-managed um, um, development of our digital media assets as time goes on. Okay, so there is the vendor side and the user side perspective. Um, vendors want to innovate. We, the users, want to benefit from their innovations. But we also need to have stable production systems, and we need to have orderly migration. So how do we deal with this tension between um, the flexibility and the precision? Um, how do we deal with avoiding the unwelcome um, surprises that we get when we just buy the latest product off the show floor at NEB? Um, best solution is in everything that we write, in our specification, in our content in media format, for example, to introduce a new channel map in audio, to think hard about uh, what is the short-term cost of doing content migration versus what's the long-term cost of having to live with last decade's content, presumably for up to the next two decades to come. And um, if you calculate that, you may be surprised and saying, um, you may surprise yourselves and saying, actually, it's worthwhile as I go through and do a media refresh within my library, it's actually worthwhile reformatting content um, every time that I do that on, say, a, a three-year cycle. This is a, a perspective that has come to me out of uh, working with the Library of Congress where um, they are producing the American Archive, which has, well, I mean, it's, uh, they're doing a lot of transfer of analog SD tapes and putting it into JPEG 2000 files. They're putting it today onto uh, T10,000 um, half-inch data tape. Um, then they're putting it away in a mine shaft. And they know that in five years' time, they've got to go back because you You've got to keep on reading your content to know that the media is still uh, reliable. And you know that the tape formats will change. In that case, it's no longer the 14 different video formats. It's, um, there's really only one data tape choice now, which is LTO. But LTO itself is now at LTO 6. And um, I guess that they may well do a migration from the LTO3 or T10,000 stuff up to an LTO6 at the next time they do their media refresh. One of the ways that they are um, keeping control of their cost and reliability is by specifying a universal file format, ASO7 in this case, so that when they do the media refresh, they will actually, at that point in time, be able to um, pull together the content costs and the process costs and the equipment um, 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 reinvestment costs and um, basically um, be able to um, do this on a nice timely cycle so that, so that um, um, they will know that if the asset lives on a T10,000 cartridge, it's old stuff, <laughs> it's legacy. If it lives on an LTF, um, LTO6 cartridge, it's the new ASO7 single common file format for archive and preservation. So <clears throat> um, I guess um, bear that in mind is all I'm saying. Um, so our goal for AS11X was to achieve uniform specifications wherever possible. So make the common technical specifications as tight as possible. Um, so, for example, we've got a single subsection for video codec. Um, could we have a single video codec? Well, almost. I think that for AS11X8, it's down to two. Okay. Um, and that's really the framework change. For AS11X9, the video codec is clearly <coughs> AAC MPEG-4, um, sorry, MPEG-4 Part 10 long op. Um, 
Um, so maybe you'll end up with there being a choice of two or three um, specifications, or maybe you'll say it will always be this particular GOP structure of uh, MPEG 4 part 10, but I will allow a range of bit rates from, say, a 10 megabit up to a 20 megabit. Um, we didn't want to, but in the case of AS11 X9, we did have to, we decided to allow two different flavors of audio, either PCM or AAC, um, but not both. So um, a particular user communities, in this case, um, say PBS, will say, I will only have AAC. <laughs> Other user communities, I'm sorry. Um, let me stop that somehow. Um, uh, where was I? Um, um, PCM, AAC, um, the, the, the benefits of AAC were very compelling. So we're taking what is basically a three megabits per second per um, um, audio pair. We're taking that down to 300 kilobits per second. Uh, hence those numbers that um, Clyde explained to you. Um, within the broadcast of specific appendices, select from the choices that the baseline allows you. So you would say, for example, you would come to this and say, well, I am going to go to a, I'm going to use X9 for my entire system, but when I use X9, I'm going to use X9 PCM. Um, but please don't say I'm going to use S11 X9, but actually I prefer a different codec for the video. I mean, that, that would be silly. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. Um, so if you need something that's prohibited in the baseline and you really need it, then come to neighbor and say, you know, I think there's actually a business reason why that baseline neighbor specification ought to be broadened. Maybe the time has come or will come to take on board HEVC coding. Don't do that unilaterally. Rely upon um, this organization that you subscribe to to help you create a consensus amongst the entire uh, community. Um, and please, um, we've tried to provide this document template to keep it consistent, keep it um, uh, easy for um, the um, uh, more challenged users, more uh, readers. Um, use, use our common for, uh, format. So. Um, we touch on a number of specifications, a number of sections, video codec, uh, sorry, the video frame rates and so forth, video codec and data rate, audio, loudness specifications. We've been able to pick one or most two or a range of bit rates in most of these areas. Um, there are some pretty vexatious areas. Um, audio channel labels is one. And that's one where um, the baseline specification is able to say, please use this approach to do it. But we put a responsibility back on the user and say, please make sure you document things in this way so that you've got clear documentation of your audio channel mapping to enable um, what we hope will be business efficiencies and uh, equipment efficiencies in audio automatic routing. Um, when we get into closed captions, we know that there are some areas that um, uh, there's just too much variability still in the market, and we can't just say, here is one winner. But we know that that's changing and they're coalescing in the industry today. There are um, also some parametric choices still inside MXF. I think from this perspective, 20 years on, we're able to point to a consensus that says, do partitioning this way. Do this operational pattern. Do your segmentation this way. Put your time codes in this way. So a very limited number of choices. There's still stuff that you're going to have to fill in yourselves. And when we come to descriptive metadata, that is a developing subject still. I'm going to spend a little while to give you some ideas on that. We'll come back onto that in a minute. But the first thing you do, you start off, you download a copy of the specification, and helpfully, those sections which are in red, you change that to your own organization's needs. Don't change the black stuff, just change the red stuff. Um, okay, so as I've just told you, there's few choices or no choices in the specifications um, for some of the most basics, but there's 
areas where there are going to be more choices, and we're going to touch on uh, each of these in turn. Okay. I think I've already said this slide <laughs> probably twice, so let's move straight on. But here is an example on video codec. We were able in X9 to say this is MPEG-4 part 10 long op. We weren't able to say exactly what is the GOP structure, nor exactly what is the data rate. We weren't able to uh, uniformly say for all users which of the MPEG-4 tools are the ones that you're going to apply. I mean, there's an, an argument still uh, persisting as to um, whether uh, or not um, some people want to have CABAC or non-CABAC coding. Some people want to have fixed GOP, other people want to have variable GOP. And so, you're going to need to create a kind of tabulation of the exact parameter choices that you have made. And you may say this is mandatory, you may say this is optional. But um, please be precise to the level that's going to make it so that you know what the variability is in your content library. And you can also guide the vendors to say, you know, I, I really want you to configure this equipment to be this set of parameters for anything that you deliver to us. In the PBS case, which is the one that I know pretty well at the moment, um, oh, sorry, um, that's my next slide. <laughs> um, um, this, this, this case is actually the specific um, AVC parameters that are used for the uh, PBS member station deliverable in X9. Um, similarly, on audio channels, um, oh, we have stereo codecs. I only just noticed that. <laughs> Um, X9 specifies PCM or AAC. Um, many people will um, continue to choose to have a, a collection of mono PCM audio tracks. Uh, PC, uh, PBS is able to work with their member stations and encourage them to one of two configurations uh, within AAC, um, uh, stereo AAC or 5.1 AAC and get some of the benefit of the rigorous definition of the MPEG standards in that. You, the users, will still need to specify which channels you require for which um, channel delivery maps you have and what, which data rates. Um, so I guess in the PCM space it's fairly easy because we can say 48 kilohertz sampling, 24-bit uh, because that's easy, and we can say um, do this as individual mono tracks. Um, in the AAC case, um, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, there's still a need to choose the, the actual, um, I think that, that um, AAC has like half a handful of data rates. You've got to pick one. PBS is able to pick 320 kilobits for 5.1 and 160 for the stereo pairs. Um, Just a point. Yep. <coughs> Please. Uh, ATSC asked us. Yep. Mm -hmm. To pick one, PCM or AAC, yep. and we pick AAC. Ah. So for no, well, for emissions, for, for emissions, emissions yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. So just so you know, mm -hmm. good. Um, yep. And that should maybe encourage the going in right. as well. Okay. Another hand. Yeah. Yes. Are there any allowance for like object-based audio, Dolby Atmos, and things like that in, in the same container, or does it have to be? A I expect that when we get into the UHD specifications, the, there will definitely be the additional channel mappings. But I'm about to, on my next slide, talk to you about channel labeling, and this is something that um, is going to be a helper in this space. Um, so. Um, I don't know what experience you have personally with the range of audio channel maps that you come across. Um, I would say probably you've come across 20 or so different channel maps, channel assignments onto your audio tracks and whatever over the years. I know that uh, PBS did a survey of the member stations and they had 40. Um, and not only that, but the, the poor PBS member stations were coming back to PBS headquarters and saying, please deliver it in my version. And PBS headquarters could not afford to build 40 different versions of each piece of content. Um, all this variability in audio tracks, up till now it has required manual QC and fix up a lot of expense. Um, and... Um, um, the question came up a few years ago, how can we put in place an architecture to make it easier in future? So we came up with, and this was sponsored largely by Dolby, in fact, 
we came up with a standard 7377-4 multi-channel audio labels. I would say that they're the most likely forward-looking solution. Um, the goal was to allow for automation of the channel routing, the channel mapping. Um, the IMF community enthusiastically embraced this, and they so much so that they went back to the original DCP digital cinema packaging standards, and they retrofitted labels into DCP as well. Um, so um, you will find that there's a number of specifications for the IMF um, audio channel mapping and channel labeling, which um, we are reusing to the fullest extent possible within the uh, broadcast-oriented specs. There are still some open questions, ones that IMF hasn't yet dealt with. Um, SAP and DVS, for example, they haven't really put much uh, requirement into that because they've been looking at the master <coughs> rather than the deliverable up till now. Um, so th the work that we have done in AS11X is not fully prescriptive, but we can show you a way to do it, and we can show you the kind of tabulation that you probably ought to do. And that's my next slide. Uh, Next but one slide. <laughs> Again, um, this is a PBS example. And they said that we have a 5.1 um, version of audio content and a 2.0 version of content. And um, they were able to say we are being very specific and saying that this is the channels that we require to be there for the 5.1. Interestingly, they're going to a stereo SAP and a stereo DVS. I think that many people have been uh, living with a mono, and maybe they're doing a dual mono if they're putting it into a stereo channel. Um, um, but um, and I'm sorry, it doesn't come out very well on the projector, but um, there's actual color coding here to show you which set of channels is connected to which other um, set of channels. Um, the idea is that, and let me float back one slide, um, within MXF now, and the channel labels that you put in, let me point at it. Here is channel labels. Down at the bottom, there's also sound field groups. There's how do you put together a stereo pair? How do you put together a 5.1? There's also groups of sound field groups. This is saying, this is my primary content versus this is my secondary service. And the specification allows you to put that information right into the essence, right into the file. So, so that's the, in MXF or in the IMF? That is in MXF. So it's right down at the bottom level of the standard, and it is enthusiastically, IMF says, you shall, you, you shall use it. Right, Our specs, X8, X9, says you shall use it. Unfortunately, because we couldn't get 100% of the way there, you've got to fill in a little table like this. And my recommendation is um, make the table with a lot of columns, well, preferably a few columns, but one column for each one. Make it so that it's computable. Make it so that a computer can actually read these tables and take action on it. Um, so don't write a specification that says, most of the time I actually want the center to be here on audio three. But sometimes, you know, if you've put it on five and you mark that with a, a China graph pen on the, on the label, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, computers can't deal with that. <laughs> um, so be precise, think like, think like a computer at the time that you write these tables. It will serve you well. Um, <clears throat> similar kind of story exists for captions. Um, we're a little bit earlier on the path with captions. Um, as you know, there have been many, many variants over the last 40 years, 45 years, but um, um, the standard kind of level of captions content is still 608, um, even though there's a whole bunch of, of, of capabilities on top of it. We're now making this transition to time text IMSC1. Um, unfortunately, there are still even several flavors of that. Um, I'm hoping that what's going to happen is that actually IMSC1 is something that says this is the 608 capability level within time text, and that's perfect for migrating your content. There may be an IMSC2 that begins to add some of the 708 capabilities, or it begins to add some other stuff. But um, I, I believe that doing a wholesale conversion of your 608 
be the compatibility bytes or line 20, but doing a wholesale conversion into IMSC1 time text, again, will serve you very well. Okay. Um, there are questions, questions about your existing business. What are you doing today? Um, are you, for example, from your program producers, are you require, re requiring people to do the up-conversion to 708? Or are you saying, no, oh, just give me the 608 and I will re-up-convert? Um, there will be service requirements based on whether or not you require second language. I think that um, here in Canada you are a wonderful place because uh, you um, do require dual languaging. No? No. Well, not every program. Not every program. Okay. 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 All right. Well, so you still have a step to go. <laughs> but it's certainly the case that you do need to concern yourself with with the French language or with with the English language, sorry, the Quebecois or the uh, the uh, uh, Canadian English. Um, and um, so, uh, marking your language tracks actually marking them with the native spoken language. I've, I've been uh, working with um, um, a company that does a lot of repurposing of US content, single language, um, which may have CC3 in Spanish, and they do repurposing into the Spanish market where they want to flip over CC1, CC3, so primary language is Spanish for primary broadcast. Um, okay. Um, Another thing to beware of um, is that there's still a lot of practice with the, the captions being used in wild files, be they SCC files or um, um, SRT files um, or um, the proprietary ones such as .cap. Um, there remains a tremendous amount of um, concern still about uh, timecode and synchronization of captions. Um, so there, um, I, I strongly recommend that, again, you, 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 you write down as precisely as you can, says this is what I want you to deliver today. And so that way um, you will be able to kind of judge your content. Do I have content that is conforming or stuff that is going to need an actual amount of research and QC before it is turned into my standard asset format? And in some ways, with your air-ready work, you're preparing with, um, for the IMF transition. Where you, once you get into that IMF transition, that IMF material, when you're doing um, multi-deliverables out of a single piece of content, you want to have the metadata in place because that way you'll be able to automate it. Um, again, AS11X, we can't yet have all the answers here. We can produce, however, a little framework that says you've got to fill in these boxes. Um, okay. Um, this slide about MXF partitioning, this is, um, I believe, becoming a bit of a non-issue nowadays. Um, it used to be that, as Clyde pointed out, there were, within those 700 pages, um, five different parameters for different ways to index material and different ways to partition, different ways to build the file. Um, um, in this year, actually for the last three years or so, there has been a strong consensus that, that there's actually only one method of MXF partitioning and one method of MXF indexing that makes sense for everybody. And so perhaps you're not going to have, you as users, as profilers of this, perhaps you're not going to have too much um, um, problem in this area. Um, as Clyde pointed out, we are going through a revision or a, an update on, of the X specifications to be even more precise about these things that we can now be precise about. Okay. Um, so here's my, um, another of my ancient pictures about um, m multiple partitions. And basically, multiple partitioning um, is a way of making it so that it's, it's kind of easy to chop up an MXF file into, p into nice, chunky pieces of content. Um, and a consensus developed that chopping it up on a 10 second cadence is probably a good thing. Um, to an extent that this has been um, um, made unnecessary in the digital cinema packaging, where they made the decision to do, um, as to do things timed on, a, on a track files being the length of a, of a reel. Um, so um, this kind of 
partitioning of MXF files right down at the bit level, although it could be, it was in the past, that Sony would do it one way, Avid would do it another way, Harmonic would do it another way, this person would do it another way, Adobe would do it this way. But actually, the focus is now come down to the point where the RDD9 methodology, the 10-second methodology, is like the answer. And although, Clyde, I don't think we specify that precisely today, I will keep reminding you about it until we do. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to save you all the, the, the hassle. Um, <clears throat> Timecode. So MXF um, itself can do anything with timecodes, any and all timecode standards. However, there is now, I think, a broad consensus which has developed, and we've been working in EBU, we've been working in SEMPTI, I've been working in other environments to bring a consensus to say there's only one kind of timecode that is the right kind of timecodes to use. We call it synthetic timecode. And this is the same thing as is used by IMF, and the same thing as is used by GCP, and the same thing as, as used by other people. So we're kind of turning off the volume on all the other flavors, apart from the historical stuff. The consensus is strong enough that the baseline AS11X is able to mandate it. So thou shalt do synthetic timecode. End of story. However, we're not yet mandating drop frame or not. We're not mandating starting time code. Um, we know that um, library material or um, um, ingested archive may have five or six, and there may be actually be business um, motivations for retaining production time code or time of day time code as well as the actual program synthetic time code. You may have reasons for doing that. You probably also have your own house standard for what the leader looks like. Now, organizations over here may insist on there being a 30 second leader with bars and tone. Organizations over here may say, no, for goodness sake, this is digital media. <laughs> first frame of action equals first frame of file. <laughs> Both are valid. Unfortunately, there's a table that you're going to have to fill in within the specification to actually document what are your house standards. That's, that's really all this says. Um, it goes on a little bit further when we get into segmentation. You, again, you may have a house standard that says that you shall put SOM and EOM in. You may have a house standard that says that what you are doing in your content is you are actually pre, um, what's the word, burning in the break structure so that you're actually are dividing the programming into acts and putting in black of the actual allowed commercial load. You may do it that way. Other people may do it a different way. And you may say, actually, what we do, do, do is we, we, we mark SOM, EOM, and we mark the, um, um, the, the, the break structure. But the content is continuous. It's another perfectly valid way to do it. You're going to need to make your choice. You're going to need to document it. But please rest assured that the segmentation track that is now provided by AS11X and by MXF is a really, really, really good place to do it. It's a good place to do it because it has all those benefits of the synthetic time code, has the benefits of a single standard. There's still some variability. You're going to need to, I think I've still got the picture here, you're going to need to choose whether or not you allow those, for example. And you're going to need to say, I've got uh, a you know, three-break, five-break structure. Or you're going to need to say that from your perspective, everything in your library, be it air ready or anything else, is, is actually a continuous piece of media with separate metadata, um, which is um, so your, your, your break structure is handled maybe by your MAM system or your business system rather than the content itself. This is an area that you will need to essentially write down. OK. This, this leaves us with descriptive metadata, another vexatious subject. <laughs> OK. Um, we've done what we can. AS11X provides a framework and examples. It builds upon the experience of AS11 original, which in turn builds upon the experience of those old things. ASCNN actually had a, 
had a descriptive metadata scheme in it way back in 2002. Um, but um, there's a lot of user considerations that you've got to bring into this. Um, I guess one of the, the, the first questions that people are probably still debating is, who is the authority on the metadata? Is it the content itself? Or is it the business system, or the playout system, or is it even, um, does your master control have the ability to reinterpret things, <laughs> or the permission to reinterpret things? And if you have a conflict between two, two sources of metadata, do you have rules for who takes precedence? So you may think of it as there, there could be some like final stage of pre-air QC where you can do a kind of triage and you can say, do all sources of metadata agree, in which case, ship it? Or is there a conflict, in which case, do I have to send that to this group who are going to rule on it? Or do I actually have to, to do a media trouble report and send it back to producer to have the, have the, the conflict removed before I will permit it to get to air? All right, so um, it then gets more complicated. Um, so which metadata schema are you going to use? And here there are many alternatives, and increasing number of alternatives. MXF, structurally, when I um, kind of work with the broadcaster, I find that the broadcaster has got half a dozen different business systems, each of which has got different metadata schemas. And the question often comes up, well, should I, says Mr. Broadcaster, should I try and harmonize? Should I try and fix all my business systems? Should I try and map everything onto MXF DMS1? And I usually say to people, no, 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 don't do that. You will waste, no, sorry. You will spend so many hundreds of hours trying to map what you're used to onto a spec that someone else invented. <laughs> and then you'll end up with something where you haven't actually added business value because actually, you may say, I've, you know, I'm, I'm using um, standard MXF metadata, but it's standard metadata as interpreted by CBC, Radio Canada. And that's completely different from DMS1 standard metadata as interpreted by Panasonic. <laughs> and these are two examples that, I, that are, are probably pretty obvious. Um, so if you can't add business value yet with common metadata schema, you may not want to go there. So what's the solution to this? Actually, my recommendation, how much is enough? Don't put in more metadata, more descriptive metadata into the file than you really feel is going to be useful to you. Um, AS11X mandates at least one identifier. That identifier may, may be an IDA number. It may be a house number. In the case of PBS, for example, it's the PBS P number that they've been using for a decade or more. Um, and then, actually, a couple of additional kind of pieces of slug information, which is really there for human security more than anything else. Um, so, I mean, here's an example. And this was given to me by PBS. They said, these are the metadata items we require to be there. Please help us format them to put them into the file in an AS11 X9 case and and I said well you know you've got to have an identifier so here's a P number and the authority for this is PBS MOS that's the um, metadata system and we're going to add some um, um, uh, program specific metadata and they said we, we actually want to have three levels of title we want to know um, the, 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 the program, the series, and the episode. And we're going to put that in there. It's going to be in a, a, um, 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 a non-mandatory way. It's there so that the system can display it on screen. An operator looking at the screens going by can, can look at it and say, OK, yeah, that's, everything is fine. Everything's fine. Everything is, oh, there's a problem. Got to check on that one before I get to that point in my rundown. So this is the level of metadata in the, the descriptive metadata in the MXF file that they need to have. Um, you, as a user of AS11X, essentially what you need to do is you need to take the tabulation that's in the AS11 specifications and just say this is what I'm going to use. So. 
Um, here's something which um, I think is, um, is it red or black in the uh, template document at the moment? Right. It's red in the, it's red, so you fill in. In the case of PBS, for example, this would be P number, this would be PBS MOS, and this would be um, the actual value. So, so, so it's fairly easy for you as users <coughs> to say this is an easy thing for us to take over and to copy from our template into the standard spec. It's a little bit more difficult when you get into more descriptive metadata, and I know, I know that even though we have reduced the size of the table in X8 and X9, we've reduced it to about 20 items, no, maybe 15 items, compared with BBC, DPP, who had 30 items. Um, there's stuff there that we, we knew we could throw away because you know, no one in North America does photosensitive epilepsy testing yet. <laughs> <laughs> so we just deleted that item of metadata. Not going to impose that on you by stealth. Um, <laughs> that there is some other information that was kind of really appropriate for the business systems and for the scheduling systems and for um, the, um, the BBC po program billing information. That is billing as in headline billing. There's that stuff which had kind of crept into the DPP spec that in the neighbor case we were able to back off on. I still think there's probably some stuff there that it still says it's mandatory. We should probably back off further and say that's optional. There is consensus that this is a good thing to do, but I mean, synopsis, for example. Synopsis today says required. We'll probably back that off to optional. Okay. My summary, then. How are we doing time-wise? Perfect. All right. Um, so here we've got um, these specs that document level level of user consensus. Um, you're going to need to customize them. Um, we've given you a template. Um, we strongly believe that doing it this way will help everybody. And actually, from my perspective, because because I, I I started off on the vendor side, but I've become on the user side as the years have passed. Um, I, I think that this puts power into the hands of the user community to actually get for the business of making television programs, to get the kind of strength um, of saying, this is what we want, please, Mr. Vendor, give it to us. And that's a position where it's good to be back in that place. I mean, we spent some time in the 80s and 90s where we were not in that space and we just had to use whatever we were sold at NAB each year. I think that this helps us to get back into the position of being in control of the way that we make programming. Thank you. Uh, and if you have questions, please ask questions. I, I have one other little, uh, a little demo which I can put together for you, I hope, which is um, my first AS11X9 AAC file. Let's see if I can do that. Um, so I think this way I have to do it. Yeah, fail. It comes alive. All right, let's move. You, oops, sorry. Okay, all right. What we need to do is to open my little bit of X9 media and um, it will now come alive and it will show me the parametric metadata that it's found in the file. It has interpreted the audio loudness, it's got the channel mapping in place. Um, and um, you can uh, play the media, and you get Hi, it's me, Coach Hooper. PBS. This is this is actually a stereo mix down of a 5.1 in AAC. Wow. And um, wow. it's also, um, to also displaying three different captions channels at the at the same time. So we'll display the 608 CC1, the CC3, and the 708 service one. Actually, you can do a six-channel version of this too. Um, PBS also big on AFD information, TV program guide information, these other bits of necessary metadata. The goal here is that if all 
If, if all of us can choose an AS11X-like environment that provides a nice, clear way to encode this stuff, then we'll have this level of commonality and simplicity within television production on the desktop <laughs> so that it can be purposed not only to over the air but also to VOD. So, okay, any questions? People are... There will be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'll hand back... Oh, well. I do have a question. Oh, uh, well. So two, two, two questions on the same sort of theme. Both are linked to, I guess, the, the fork of this early on from its use in DCPs. Um, DCP support encryption, mm -hmm. is that something that sort of comes on this side at all or not at all um, for content? The, interestingly, um, DCP encryption is something that is very clearly still used for the theatrical distribution. Mm -hmm. But every time I talk to um, people who are doing production packaging, they all say, we never do encryption in-house um, on the in-house content. I mean, it's basically, they're, they're relying upon physical security. Right. Okay. Which is fine. I, I would say one thing, which is mm -hmm. that the DCP encryption framework, um, when we did the um, archival format, ASO7, mm -hmm. we looked at it and said, we're not going to use the encryption capability of it, but it does have hashing. Yes. Okay. And so in ASO7, we mandated doing frame by frame content hashing and using the standard methodology for doing that. And actually, the requirement in, in, in that space was let's just imagine that, that um, after World War III, all you've got is like half an LTO tape. <laughs> It sure would be nice to actually verify frame by frame and to get to actually work out that you know, this frame was this, this frame was, was was 13 minutes before the Big Bang, or this one was after right. that kind of stuff. Right. So that's so that's the encryption space. Now, having said that, I do believe that IMF will take on board the same encryption and the same hashing capability. They may want to change it a little bit. There is provision for different hashing algorithms. But at this point in time, none of the IMF profiles yet mandate it. Okay. They may in future. Okay. And I guess sort of following that is the, the DCP fork of this infrastructure. Is it a completely separate fork? Is there sort of ever a roadmap where it might rejoin what IMF is doing with the, the enhancements that the IMF is, is bringing in there? Or is DCP pretty much going to stay its own? Um, to the extent that American theatrical has taken DCP on board and they're very conservative, I don't expect it to change back. To the right. extent that other people have not yet picked up um, the kind of full, tightly specified DCP for international mm -hmm. um, and um, other venue um, presentation, I expect that um, um, there will be a pressure on the 7428, 429 standards to be able to be profiled in a much more IMF-like forgiving way. Right. Okay, great, thanks.